Uh, members, before the break, we were listening to Jacinda Ardern. She has the call, and Jacinda has four minutes and 18 seconds remaining, should she wish to take the call. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Jacinda um, Ardern. And before the dinner break, Mr Chair, I was um, touching on the um, three key components, the three themes that seem to uh, uh, be picked up in most of the um, submissions that we heard um, as, a, as a select committee. And the first of those were the need for local boards to have greater power. The second, were, uh, the second was a very strong theme around um, uh, having greater say over Auckland's assets and, and what I would call a, a, a pretty widespread aversion to the idea of privatisation, particularly as it related to um, water. And then finally, there were um, uh, widespread concerns around um, the CCOs. Now, the, the final response that's come through from the government around um, CCOs, to me, um, says that the government has, has sort of missed the point. Submitters weren't just saying that their overwhelming concern was um, just the way that CCOs would operate necessarily, um, the technical operating um, matters around a CCO, um, but their, their overwhelming use um, in this legislation, the fact that 75% of the council's assets would sit um, with these bodies and the fact that the general principle of the way they would operate was perceived to be very much at arm's length to demo the more democratic institution of the council itself. So tweaking round the edges, in my mind, and I imagine in the minds of, of a good majority of Aucklanders, hasn't, hasn't fixed that general principle. Um, so in my mind, despite, um, despite the changes that have been made by the government, it hasn't addressed the substantive concern uh, expressed by Aucklanders. But I do want to go over some of the, um, the changes that we've seen made, um, uh, made by the government as, as suggested by the Select Committee. And in response to that strong uh, message from submitters, I think that we got a relatively weak message back. In fact, very much I get the sense that the, um, the government is saying that we'll let others decide. So I haven't really seen um, leadership on this issue where the public were really asking for leadership on this issue. So that's set out in um, 75 AA under part eight. We see there a requirement that the council must adopt um, basically a policy on the way these CCOs would operate, including various statements, statements around um, objectives and priorities, statements around expectations of how the CCOs would work with the priorities of central government, of local government planning. And then we get down to E, which is probably um, touches on at the heart of some of the issues raised by submitters. It, sets out, it says that the um, statement from the council must set out any circumstances in which each substantive council-controlled organisation must conduct its business as if it were subject to part seven of the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act 1987. So it must set out any circumstances in which they will behave in that open and transparent way. So rather than it being a general principle that they will, and setting out the small areas in which they may create perhaps an exception, we're working on the inverse. And in my mind, if we were sticking with a general principle of transparency, of openness, of the public having access to these organisations, it would have been in the reverse. And I wouldn't mind the Minister perhaps speaking on that point. I do remember the North Shore Council making a, making a very compelling argument that that is the way those CCOs should operate, that only in circumstances only in circumstances where there were compelling reasons why these meetings should not be open, perhaps for contractual reasons or the like, that they should be by default in the same way that a council operates. And I asked the question of, of North Shore, how often would that be? And they said probably no more than 20% of their business, and they then promptly released all information afterwards if any meeting was closed. I don't believe that... Well, Mr Chair, Mr Chair, Mr Chair... Mr I Chair, Mr and, Chair, uh, Mr Chair. thank you Mr Chair, um, because I do want to go on to um, uh, the waterfront CCO in a moment. I do not believe what is being set out by the government goes to the substantive heart of that issue, because in fact I think there has been a general misinterpretation. People have assumed that there is a requirement that the CCOs operate in this way. Rather, we've given the council a may require 
We haven't even set out a, a, a shown leadership here and required that the council instruct CCOs to conduct all of their business in that way. We've simply given them the option. I would have um, preferred, and I'm sure many of the submitters would have, to see much more leadership on this issue. I do want to go to one of the CCOs themselves to see actually how this is going to operate um, in practice. And I see that the Waterfront um, Development Agency was an issue that um, people submitted on with, with a, a number of concerns. And we see this addressed in the commentary from the Select Committee. Um, it says that we consider that it would be useful if the process for establishing the Waterfront Development CCO were outlined in the bill. And accordingly recommend amending Clause 18. This amendment addresses concerns that the bill does not prescribe the role, functions and responsibilities of the water development CCO. So how are they addressing the concern that there, aren't any, uh, there is no detail on the role, functions and responsibilities? They simply say they'll do it in order of council. Again, not a particularly transparent, open um, uh, and accessible way for, to respond to a, a deeply held public concern. And so what were the substantive changes that we saw made to the Auckland Waterfront Development Agency? Well, we called it something else. It's now named the Waterfront Development Council Controlled Organisation. I wouldn't mind, actually, I'd invite the Speaker to spend a little more time outlining to the House what he sees as the substantive changes to the Waterfront Development Agency because they seem cosmetic to me. And I'm happy to be corrected on that. But if he could explain to me um, the significant difference between it being established um, as an entity, as a council control organisation for the Auckland Council, how that is different to what we had before, I'd be pleased to hear it. I'd also be really pleased to hear any government member explain to me how in a tangible way the public will really have input into the substantial issue of waterfront development. Just looking at the various elements of waterfront development we have going on in Auckland, we have a tank farm, a development project which takes up 29 hectares of the waterfront, a $200 million project uh, of public money being spent, which goes into the billions when we include private. We also have the, the debate around Queen's Wharf, and the ultimate test will be how the waterfront CCO, the council, the ports, the public, and, I would add, central government will all interact to develop a master plan which ultimately the public are happy with. Because at the moment, we've seen piecemeal decision-making on our waterfront. And I have to say that I'm not, I'm not heartened by the what we have in this bill, that it will be any different now than what we currently have. I'd also like to add into the mix that we can't exclude the fact that central government will have its way on the waterfront, as it already has with Queen's Wharf. Now, we may claim that uh, we've had a process there that the ARC alone has been involved with. We all know in reality, though, that John Key has very firmly said that he wants Party Central down on Queen's Wharf, so any attempt by the public to have their say is being wiped out of the water by the fact that those sheds are going to come down in a matter of weeks to make way for the Prime Minister's much-heralded Party Central. How will this bill change that? How will this bill make sure that the public ultimately have their overriding views, have their views heard on the way our waterfront is developed, when at the moment central government is able to hold such sway over such significant decisions as the removal of 98-year-old historic sheds, and then claim that a decision hasn't been made, and then claim that in fact we are leaving this as an open option for the people of Auckland to decide on, when come a couple of weeks' time those sheds will be down, that question won't be for, be for debate for them anymore. So how will the Waterfront Development Council controlled organisation contend with thing, issues like that coming from central government? How will it act as a voice in between uh, the council and the ports and central government? How will the public have their say in amongst all of that? I do want to say that I am glad, though, that the, um, both mayors have said that they want to look at um, Auckland, the Auckland Waterfront Vision 2040 document, which was developed four years ago. Um, because... Uh, Chairman. I call